Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau was a groundbreaking director in many ways, but one of the most significant innovations in his films was the invention of the unchained camera technique, arguably the most important stylistic innovation of the 20th century. Freeing the camera from its shackles allowed for unprecedented mobility, expanded the filmic language, and set the stage for some of the most commonly used cinematic techniques of contemporary cinema. In his own words, the camera is the director's sketching pencil. It should be as mobile as possible to capture every passing mood, and it is important that the mechanics of cinema should not be interposed between the spectator and the picture. The film director must divorce himself from every tradition, theatrical or literary, to make the best possible use of his new medium. This video essay will examine the moving camera in Murnau's work in chronological order, starting from Nosferatu to the debut of the Unchained Camera in The Last Laugh and beyond. We will explore the ways Murnau used camera movements to modernize film as an art form, as well as touch upon the influence that his techniques had on other filmmakers. Throughout Nosferatu, the camera remains largely static, likely due to technical limitations. However, there are some significant camera movements, such as this panning shot of the mountains. It emphasizes the character's alienation in this new overwhelming environment, and the following shot juxtaposes the sleeping human figure against the vast wilderness. Instances of camera movement appear to limit themselves to these sublime landscape shots, also seen with this shot of the boat crossing the ocean. The cinematography is not very mobile in Phantom. There are a few subtle camera movements employed to give a better sense of space and fit its subjects into the frame. However, towards the end of the film there is one scene where the camera truly flows and dances with the characters, in a scene which takes place during a party. Not only is it used to enlarge the space, but also creates a lively yet somewhat uncomfortable atmosphere, as the protagonist is not very in control. These experiments in camera movement would ultimately lead to the pioneering techniques used in The Last Laugh, released in 1924. In collaboration with cinematographer Carl Freund, Murnau introduced the unchained camera to the world. This would not only alter the great director's style, it would also change the landscape of film forever. As film scholar Arthur Knight writes, the camera is constantly on the prowl, stalking the characters portrayed. The gestation of the Unchained Camera came from Murnau and screenwriter Carl Mayer. As they began working on The Last Laugh, they got the idea of using the camera from the point of view of the central character, like a secret eye, in order to record his inner reactions and emotions. After discussing it with Freund, they began developing the Unchained Camera immediately. Freund said of Murnau, He had considered using the moving camera from the start. He asked me if I could film an actress in long shot, and then, by traveling forward, show a close-up of only her eyes. This being the moment when the doorman's on the discovers that he has been put in charge of the lavatories. He said he wanted my camera on a dolly at all times. The use of camera in the film acts in tandem with the character's mental states, and works towards giving the audience a subjective, expressionist experience. Throughout the film, mobile tracking shots follow the protagonist through periods of intense distress. This is often seen together with subjective shots that show the world through the doorman's eyes, and showing his gradual mental disintegration and hopelessness. In these moments, particularly during the famous dream sequence, the frenzied movements of the camera convey the character's disturbed mental state in a way not previously seen in cinema. In order to create the desired movements, the camera was taken from the trolley and put on a crane, or attached to Freund's chest while he rode a bicycle. According to Frederick Wynne Jones, a representative for UFA films, the studio allowed for experimentation on their premises, and it was not unusual to see Freund making test shots from various angles in his spare time. Murnau clearly had a knack for innovation. Speaking of his own directorial process, he said, My pictures are rarely of the conventional type and I, probably more than most directors, require things that are not on hand. A contemporaneous review from Agnes Smith wrote of the movie, The last laugh marks the only technical advance in pictures since D.W. Griffith invented the close-up and the flashback. The camera is centered almost entirely on Mr. Yannick's. It reads his thoughts, it follows his footsteps, it acts his eyes, it interprets his emotions. With the help of this marvelous camera, you lift the character with him. This new technological development allowed Murnau to rid his film of the obstructive presence of intertitles and deliver the story in an almost purely pictorial way. What will remain to be seen is the impact of this new unchained camera. 
David Boardwall writes that once the last lab had been recognized for its fluid movements, UFA could publicize other films that employed the flying camera and celebrate Murnau's films as the first to break through the limitations that the cinema had hitherto placed upon the gaze of the spectator. Technical novelty, then as now, helped in marketing and selling the movie. Murnau would return to these techniques for the rest of his career, as we can see with this shot from Faust. While the director of photography was changed from Karl Freund to Karl Hoffmann, both are pedestal shots, partially obscured by layered objects in the foreground, and are used to establish the scene. The magical flight scene that precedes this also used the moving camera to create a fantastical experience in ways not previously possible in film. In Sunrise, camera movement is used in one of the first shots of the film through an ascending crane shot coming off a boat with vocationers from the city arriving to a village. This sequence points to the idyllic rural setting that will later be contrasted with the urban life from which the vacationers have come. Not much later, Murnau returns to his trademark prowling camera in a scene in which a seductive vamp from the city has summoned her married country lover to secretly meet her in a swamp. This was the first film Murnau shot in America, and the massive budget afforded to him by Fox allowed for further innovation. An elevated platform was built to follow the man through the marshes. The camera pans away and shifts its gaze from the farmer, moving through the branches and arriving at the vamp ahead of him. What's interesting is that it seemingly moves of its own accord, assuming its own intentionality, and heightening the sense of voyeurism in the audience. The movement also implies freedom, as the man's affair is a way of liberating himself from the boredom of country life. Murnau uses superimposed mobile shots which emphasize the fast pace of modernity and metropolitanism. Later in the film, the man and his wife end up in the city, and the camera movement is used not only to convey its overwhelming momentum, but also to highlight the married couple's rekindled love, as well as the peaceful nature of their life in the village, far from the chaos of the city. Murnau's next film, City Girl, was released in 1930. By then the moving camera was already an established presence in his films. Unlike his earliest movies, the use of the moving camera was not limited to a few specific shots. Instead it already functioned as a key component that assisted in creating a much more dynamic picture. City Girl also presents one of the most remarkable tracking shots in the history of film. We tangibly feel the infatuation and excitement of the young couple, as Murnau makes us glide through the fields with his unmistakable fluidity. The weightlessness of the camera reflects their carefree mood, as they have yet to face the harsh disappointing reality awaiting them at the farm of the protagonist's unwelcoming father. American film critic Andrew Cyrus claims that Murnau's influence on cinema has proved to be even more lasting than the one of Sergei Eisenstein. Murnau's moving camera is a more immersive way of portraying the world and the trend in modern films has also been towards escaping studio sets. While montage editing has been largely eschewed in favor of continuity editing, the unchained camera is something that has remained pertinent for filmmakers as diverse as Bellatar and Alejandro González Iñárritu. One of the key figures influenced by Murnau was Alfred Hitchcock, who interned at the UFA studios in Berlin and witnessed the filming of The Last Laugh. While this influence took many forms, one major aspect was the unchained camera itself. Both filmmakers were known for exploring psychological states on screen, and both made frequent use of subjective shots that conveyed the characters in their states. Hitchcock recalled, The Last Laugh was almost the perfect film. It told its story even without subtitles, from beginning to end entirely by the use of imagery, and that had a tremendous influence on me. Hitchcock often claimed that the time he spent in Germany was the only external formative influence in his entire career. Film scholar James N. Bates stated that Hitchcock's work gives us an impression of how Murnau's films might have developed, in technique if not in theme, had he not prematurely passed away in a car crash in 1931. Of course, we can only speculate, but it is safe to say that Murnau would have continued as one of the medium's true leading pioneers. <laughs>